So how does the oil actually flow through your engine? We've already done oil pressure and we did oil pumps. So now I want to talk about the circulate. The circulation. The sir. <laughs> I want I want to talk about the circulatory or circulatory part of the oiling system. And it's actually fairly it, it fairly universal. There are some exceptions and we'll talk about some of the exceptions as we go along. But for the most part, I want to focus on the engines that we primarily look at on this channel, which are like traditional American V8s, Chryslers, General Motors, Fords, um, AMCs. They all have certain things that are, that are in common that are universal. And some of them are actually counterintuitive. And that's one of the reasons why like, this is kind of an important video or an important thing to know. So when I say counterintuitive, I say counterintuitive because we think of the most important part of the engine, the part that needs the most oil. It's got to be the crankshaft, the main bearings, the rod bearings, the bottom end, because that's where the action, that's where the real action takes place. But when you're talking about the oiling system of the production, the standard production American style V8, anything, basically anything designed from the early 1950s forward, that's not the priority. The priority in these engines and the oiling system is actually to the lifters. Because whether or not the engines we're talking about were, came standard with hydraulic lifters, they were all designed for the provision of hydraulic lifters. And so that's why when you talk about anything designed for, let's say, 1951, 1952, 53 forward, they all oil essentially the same way. And it sends its priority to the lifter galleys. Why did they do that, right? You know, because you're mass producing for a market that is, is that they're not mechanically inclined. They're not mechanically, they don't care about things like what gets oil first. They care about quiet, smooth operation. So making sure that every time the engine starts, the lifters are dead quiet and stay that way is why priority goes to the hydraulic lifters or to the lifter galleys before it goes to the mains. So, that in mind, let's take a tour of a typical American V8 oiling system, circulatory system, and see how it all flows. So, obviously it starts down in the pan with the pickup. No explanation needed there. That's about as universal a part as you can get. From there, it goes to the pump. And we already talked about the pump. We already covered the gears inside, the rotors, um, and the bypass system, which regulates the amount of pressure that it sees. From the pump, it goes to the filter. So on the filter, the outer part of the media is the first thing to get oil. And then it's, the oil is forced through the media and then out through the center. Now from this is where it starts to circulate throughout the engine. So, let's look at, this is a big block Chrysler, but this is so typical. I, yeah, I know most engines have an internal oil pump. This one's got an external oil pump. But the passages, the, uh, the way the passages are laid out is fairly universal. So, here's how this goes. So this is the main oil feed into the engine. Now from here, we have a passage that's drilled this way. See, there's a, the galley plug in here. And from here, it goes to this oil galley, okay? Now, this is the first place to get oil in this engine. Now, from here, if you come to the back, you'll see there's a passage that's here and here, and here are the drill spots for those passages. So this is where the oil coming up from the pump comes through this galley, crosses over here, and this is where you take your oil pressure reading from. So if you've got a gauge, this is where you're picking it up from or even an idiot light, and then down to here. And now from here, it goes forward along this galley and dead ends right here. So the way this is designed, the way this is out outlined here, is that this whole section has to be pressurized with oil before anything else gets it. All right, now we roll this thing over All right, we can do this. If we roll this thing over, 
we'll see these holes right here. Now these holes have two drill, okay, it's drilled two different ways. So one goes straight up to the cam bearing, and then the other one is drilled on an angle to meet the oil galley. So what's happening is coming down from the, from the main galley this way, and then from here, the main bearing is fed, and also the cam bearing is fed. So, so far, the most important part of the engine, the crank, the rods, all of that, isn't getting any oil yet. Now, here's one of the things you need to understand. Engines that have stock oil clearances and stock side clearances on the rods, they're kept as tight as they are so that there'll always be a film of oil when the engine is first started. So basically what's going to happen is when you start the engine, even though during the first two or three seconds that it's running, the crankshaft isn't getting any oil, that oil film is held in place by the tighter clearances and it keeps the bottom end quiet while the lifters get pressurized. And so they don't collapse, they don't make any noise. And that's why all of these oiling systems are laid out in this fashion. So, from here we're going into two different areas. We're going to go in, we're, we're talking about crankshaft oiling and then we're going to talk about top end oiling. All right, so now we're ready to oil the crank and the rods. So, this is an upper main shell, an upper main bearing shell. So you see there's the oil hole that corresponds with the hole that's drilled in the saddle, the main feed, and then you'll see that there's a groove right here, and that's a trough. Now here's the purpose of that trough. In the crankshaft, you've got these holes drilled. So you've got your oil feed holes. So here's the number one main bearing and here's the number one rod bearing. So if you take this wire here and we pass it through, you see that we've got, we've got it popping out the other side. So there's your oil path from the main bearing to the rod. The trough in that upper shell makes sure that this gets a duration, a long duration of oil shot to the rod. Now, this is the number one, and it only has one oil hole because it's only going to feed this one journal, this one rod journal. When you get to the number two main, you've got two holes. So here's one, and here's the other. And this one hole feeds the number two rod journal, and this hole feeds the number three rod journal and so on down the line until you get to number five and again number five will only have one hole in it because it's only feeding the number eight rod journal. So that's essentially the oil flow through the main oil flow through the engine from the pump through the lifter galleys down to the crankshaft and then eventually down to the connecting rods. Now there are some exceptions like for, I'll use the Ford FE as an example. The Ford FE has were originally designed gave too much priority to the lifters. So when they started to really lean on that engine for high performance use, they added an oil galley along the side of the engine right here. And those are the side oilers. So they added a tube along cast into the block here and then drilled through to each of the mains. That's the first, as far as I, I know of, that's the first external side oiling high performance application. Later on, as, as race engines were developed, and this is one of the big differences between a production engine or a production block and a race block. A race block will always prioritize the oiling to the crankshaft and minimize the oiling to the lifter galleys because in those engines, on a race engine, you're using solid lifters. You're not worried about the hydraulics, so they don't have to be pressurized. That's the difference between a race oiling system, the main difference, between a race oiling system and a street oiling system. Uh, in fact, that was one of the big advantages when, when, when they introduced like the Mylodon 7 liter and the later, later the, the KB Hemi version of the 426. That was one of the main benefits of those engines is they were designed as side oilers prioritizing the crankshaft so they got that much more life out of them. There were other benefits, but that was one of the big ones. So, that's the flow through the main part of the block. Now we get to the top end of the engine, and we're talking about the lifter bores. So let's roll this thing back over here, 
Okay. Wait, before I do that, let's go back to the bottom for just one second. So we showed this upper shell and the trough that it uses. But the lower shell on nearly all production V8s has no groove. There's no trough. That's because the manufacturer only wants a certain amount of oil going to the connecting rods. They don't want to overwhelm the connecting rods or steal that much oil from the rest of the engine. So only half of the shell, only half of the bearing, has that oil and groove, and the other half doesn't. Now one of the modifications that you'll make on a high performance engine is to use fully grooved mains. And a lot of guys will just buy two sets of mains and they'll just put two uppers in, in the shell. So you'll have an upper in the top and an upper in the bottom. That's a great modification. It definitely increases the volume of oil that's getting to the connecting rod, but it reduces the overall volume of oil to the engine. So if you do go to a fully grooved main, at that point, you definitely want to upgrade to a higher volume oil pump, higher pressure, higher, vo higher volume oil pump, because you're basically, you're essentially doubling the amount of oil that's able to get to the connecting rods. All right, so now let's go to the top. So now we get back to the top end of the motor and the lifters and the rockers and all of that. So on most engines, Chevys, um, the rockers are oiled through the push rods. So you've got the main oil galley feeding the lifters, whether they're solid or hydraulic, it doesn't matter. The main oil galley is feeding the lifters, and then there's a passage inside the lifter that comes through the top and mates up to a hole in a pushrod, and that hole in a pushrod sends oil to the rockers. And that's how those are kept going. On a Chrysler, on the other hand, Chrysler's oil through the rocker shifts. So they use these passages right here. And from here it goes through the cylinder heads to the rocker shafts and then drips back down and that's the end of that circulation. So that pretty much covers all of the pressurized sections of the typical V8 oiling system or American engine oiling system. I did leave one thing out. Pin oilers. So, and this comes in a couple of different variations. You'll see that most engines will have, like for instance here on this big block Chrysler, you'll see this diagonal cut on the surface of the cap. And the purpose of that, when it's all put together, is to take some of the oil from the rod bearing and squirt it towards the wrist pin. Now some engines have an actual passage in the rod that'll squirt the pin of the cylinder or the, the, the piston that it's attached to. And some of them, like this Chrysler, are designed to squirt oil across the crankcase at the bottom end of its opposing piston. So pin oilers is part of it. Now we talked about how nearly all engines designed from the mid-1950s forward prioritize the lifters for oiling. One common exception to that is the Slant 6, which actually has no lifter oiling at all. They're strictly oiled by splash, which is one of the reasons why you don't want really to use a crank scraper on one of those motors. But that's besides the point. When Chrysler engineers designed that engine in 1858, 1959, they couldn't imagine a time that it would ever have hydraulic lifters. So they designed it without that intersecting oil galley. When they went to hydraulics in 1981, what they did with that was they fed the lifters, the hydraulic lifters, through the push rods. So pressurized oil came up through the rockers and was fed through the rockers, through the push rods, down to the lifters, and that's how they maintain their hydraulic you know, tension. It's also one of the reasons why those engines are known for lifter noises. You know, and not just the mechanical lifter noise, but the later slant sixes, 81 through 87, you start them up and they're going tick, 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 for a long time, because it takes a while for that oil to circulate. There are a couple of other engines, common engines, that oil like that, but it's, it's definitely not the best way. It's like a Band-Aid fix. So I think that covers pretty much all of it. Timing chains and distributed drive gears, oil pump drive gears, are generally oiled by splash or runoff. But the pressurized part of it is pretty much common to all of these things. And of course, drain back is important. And that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that there's no extra casting flash or you want to deburr the inside of the block, any, any sharp edges, because you want whatever oil goes to the top end of the engine to be able to flush itself cleanly down to the bottom with as little trouble as possible. On some engines where you're dealing with a high volume of oil that's getting to the top, it's common to drill holes 
like on these Chryslers, it's common to drill holes alongside the lifter bores for extra oil drain back. I think that pretty much covers it all. Um, I, okay, here's one thing that, that's a quirk. When you have a valve train failure in one of these engines that has priority lifter oiling, there's a good chance, especially at high RPM, that you'll wipe out the bottom end of the engine. And that's because the lifter, if the lifter gets kicked up out of the bore, which is a common thing to happen, but especially like you know, 6,000, 7,000 RPM, you have valve train failure, it kicks the lifter out of the bore, it exposes that main galley, and it's just the same as having one of your major arteries sliced open. There's a good chance that you're going to bleed out internally or externally, well the engine will bleed out internally and you won't get the pressure to the bottom end. Also, on some engines, like for instance these Chryslers for example, it's very common when you have a low oil pressure situation, and this is one of, this is one of the problems with, those, with the rocker oiling. When you have a low oil pressure situation, even for just a, a couple of seconds, there's a good chance you'll spin a rod bearing. And it will always be on the big blocks for example, small blocks a little bit different, but on big blocks for example, you'll spin either the number six or the number seven rod bearing. And that's because when oil pressure drops for just a little bit, those, that main bearing, that number, the number four main bearing, is feeding the galleys that lead to the rocker shaft. So that's the first part of the engine to go dry. And that's common, like I said, common cause of main bearing or rod bearing failure on big block Chryslers with just a little bit of oil starvation. Now it's a good system and it's a bad system at the same time. So that's it. I hope you got something out of that. The next time around we'll talk about different types of oil. I get a lot of people ask about synthetic motor oil and older engines and so on and so forth, but we'll get into that the next time we talk about oiling systems. So that's it. Hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.